Thank you everyone for coming. We are so excited to be here tonight. Before we do anything though, however, we would love to have Father Boniface uh, start us off in prayer. So. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, our primary purpose is to worship you and we want to adore you and all that we do here this evening to acknowledge your majesty and the saving love that you have revealed to us in your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has restored and redeemed us. We ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit, transform us, conform us more and more into Christ. And we trust in the prayers of our mother and St. Joseph, all the holy angels, to unite us through this electronic circuitry and through these great distances with each other and most especially with each other, that we might be more united with you. We ask for your blessing in a special way on Sister Miriam as she opens her heart to us and shares her journey and her wisdom, that her words may be anointed, that she might say what you want her to say and that we might hear what you want each of us personally to hear. And we ask all this through the intercession of Our Lady. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, pray Pray for for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father Boniface, one of our beloved teachers and spiritual fathers here at Avila. And thank you to everyone in the Avila Army, our monthly donors who have made this webinar possible. And before we uh, hand it over to Sister Miriam Miriam, and have her introduce herself, um, I just wanted to say I'm so excited about this topic, excited to have you here Um, healing is always, if anyone knows me, if you guys have been around, you know, that healing is a very passionate topic of mine. Um, my background is in psychology and, um, I love how it integrates with our faith and in spiritual direction and how it can really help us in prayer. And so, um, I'm just thrilled to have you here, sister, and really grateful for your time this evening and just pray that God will bless us. Mm -hmm. So, um, Uh, Claire, actually, do you want to chime in and give a little intro to sister? Well, I'm going to let her do that, but I thought it was really um, appropriate to just kind of mention, first of all, well, first of all, I do not have a background in psychology. I am, I kind of was thinking about it and I kind of represent everybody else here tonight that (laughs) desires to grow closer to the Lord. I call myself a student of the interior life, and I think I will be for the rest of my life. I love learning about the faith. I love um, learning about prayer. And I I am a student of Father Boniface in spiritual direction because I do feel called to even more learn how to teach others to grow closer to the Lord in prayer. And as I take that journey, you, you know, like everybody, I realize how much the Lord is inviting me to be healed. Mm -hmm. And I think at the Avila, foundation, we really see our primary mission is helping people grow in prayer through the authentic Catholic spiritual tradition of the church. And you can't do that without realizing that the same God that raised people from the dead and healed the sick is inviting you to the same relationship with him of Mm -hmm. healing. And so more and more, I think um, we are coming to appreciate the relationship between authentic Catholic prayer and the healing work of God and how those two things are integrated. And so it's just a joy to be able to bring this to our people and to invite them to consider what God has for him, for them, that he has more, that he always has more. Um, And that this healing process is never done alone. It's always with others. And so we have a guest today who seems to have a special charism for inviting people to consider that God has um, healing graces for them and to invite them to open themselves up to those graces. So 
That being said, Sister Miriam, could you, I could read a bio and it would be very impressive. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> I am not going to, I'm just going to invite you to tell um, everybody here today a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, thank Well, thank you. First of all, Claire and Ann, thank you so much. And Father Boniface, so lovely to see you again. Uh, you all are very dear to me. So I, I feel honored to be here. I you know my background's not in psychology either. It's like mostly in sports. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was just a college girl who wanted to work for ESPN and God radically interrupted my life in, in a variety of ways. And so, um, yeah, it's been a very long journey and it's a journey that continues to this very moment as I sit here before you. I, it's just so wonderful that that conversion and love and wholeness happens every day. And I really, I can honestly tell you without any like pietistical sentiment that I hope it never ends. I I hope I never get to a point to where I tell Jesus that's enough or no, I'm good enough, Lord. No, that's enough. I, I, I hope he opens every part of my heart forever for the rest of my journey, because the day that I say that's enough, the day that's the day my heart dies, you know? So I, it's worth it. It's, it's the fullness of our life. And, um, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to be on this journey, especially with people like you. So yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. So I can tell you a bit about myself. If you want, I am a member of the society of our lady of the most Holy Trinity. Um, we're a, um, community. I live in, um, um, Corpus Christi, Texas. So we uh, were founded in 1958 and we serve in teams of pre-sisters and laity. We serve in areas of deepest apostolic need. So I live at our headquarters here and I've been here for many years. And over the years, I've served in a lot of different uh, ways of directing novices and parish you know, um, ministry and working with children at a Catholic school. And then uh, for many years, I've sp- I speak, travel and speak full time. I, I work a lot with the John Paul II Healing Center headed by Dr. Bob Schutz. So I've worked with them for many, many years and we do a lot of healing retreats for priests and religious sisters and laity. And so I, that's yeah, that's been a, a deep journey of my own heart and uh, to be able to just to travel and, and speak and actually to watch people encounter Christ. I, that's, that's the best, that's the best thing that it's, that's what, you know, I, and I often say that it's really true of people. They don't ultimately really want to meet me when they talk at a conference. Like they really don't what, what they really want to have is a, a, an encounter with the living Lord Jesus. And that's what people want from all of us. Like they, they want to know that God's alive and well, and that their lives matter and their suffering matters and that their dreams matter and that nothing is in vain, that God loves them unconditionally. I, it's like, it's stunning really just the, our human hearts and just, just the call of love. It's, it's, it's such a beautiful life really. Yeah. Well, they may want to meet Jesus, but I think they also want to meet you. Because you, <laughs> well, you just incarnate him so beautifully. Oh, you're very kind. <laughs> and you're so very we're kind. just so joyful to have you with us. Thank Today, you. you have a book coming out mm-hmm. for Lent with Ave Maria Press called Restore. Yes. And it's a guided journal that invites um, people to really consider Lent a very particular time when the Lord may be wanting to do something deep within their heart. And so mm-hmm. we wanted to dive into that and some of the topics within the book Um tonight. And uh, we, we, do you want to give us a little overview, first of all, about what your purpose was in the book, what your hopes are for those that would um, go journey with you and the Lord in Lent in this way? Sure, sure. This, the the book that we're going to go through is, is really a book that comes from my heart. And I wrote a book called Loved As I Am in 2014, which was chronicling kind of my own healing journey and also theology of the body and the catechism, like definition of the human person and like the journey of the human person. And I wrote that almost, gosh, like almost 10 years ago. And so over the last, like, say almost 10 years, you know, what has the Lord been doing in my life? And, and what has the Lord been speaking through the Holy Spirit through like the face of the earth? Like, what is the Holy Spirit speaking right now to the church? Like, what is he speaking to the people of God? And people are, are so hungry for, for wholeness and communion. And I, I think that's what I want to say first and foremost, that this, this is he, the healing journey is not about Jesus fixing us. Like Christ does not come to fix us. He comes to heal us. And that's two very different things. He comes to bring us into wholeness and communion. And there's a particular dynamic of Lent that um, is a particular area of healing as we practice the spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Those actually are meant to be healing disciplines. Like when you look at, at some of those disciplines, they're actually listed under the sacrament of reconciliation, which is sacrament of healing. And so what these disciplines do ultimately is they heal our relationship with God. They heal our relationship with ourselves and they heal our relationships with our relationship with others as a, as a, as a healing salve to how we were broken in the garden. And so 
when we think about Lent and we kind of think about just, you know, you know, all of us have stories about Lent. All of us have many feelings about Lent. You know, some of us love it. Some of us hate it. Some of us do the obligatory chocolate alcohol thing. And I, you just think, so I, I remember many years ago, I was on Ash Wednesday. I was living in Seattle and I was accompanying to a, a sister to a doctor's appointment. And, you know, we just gone to mass. So we still had ashes on her forehead. And this guy, it was so great. This guy gets in the elevator, literally has two bags of McDonald's and a big soda. And he's like, oh, he's like, oh my gosh, it's Ash Wednesday. And we're like, yeah, it's Ash Wednesday. He's like, oh, I totally forgot, you know? And so we had kind of these different relationships with Lent. And then, you know, a week or two or three in, it's almost like New Year's resolutions. Like what, what's really happening on an Easter Sunday? What's, what's supposed to happen? And so ultimately this journey of, of which it takes many forms in this particular vein of when we undertake these practices with Christ and allow him to bring us into wholeness and community in every way, we, we come into the Paschal resurrection remarkably transformed. And that, that's really my desire is that even if it's in a very small way, and that's why I call it a dangerous path. You know, you talk about danger, meaning, you know, harm or injury. And, it, and this causes harm or injury to our idols, <laughs> to our, our facades, our self-defense mechanisms. Um, like just today, I was talking to a friend in the car and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Like, I did not know that about myself. And so I'm like, so grateful that that part of me was revealed. And so that's what happens on the journey of love, because that's being naked and vulnerable. That's being naked and unashamed. And that's the journey of Christ. Like that's how Jesus lives. And he's teaching us how to live as he lives and having an integrated life. Cause Christ is, is the man who's integrated wholly and he's bringing us into integration. So that's kind of a overview of that. Wow. I, I have to say when I read the book and I, you know, so often we think of Len as like white knuckling it. Like yeah. we're just going to sacrifice and we're going to get through it and we're going to do it. And I think even intellectually, I didn't think I thought of Lent that way when I was reading um, the book, just your, the way that you expressed the vulnerability yeah. that Lent opens up in us and the opportunity for our deepest desires to be revealed because we stop stuffing ourselves as much with all of the things that we use to numb and, you know, if we're doing it right and we're really in, you know, asking the Lord, what do you want me to give up? Yeah. It exposes all kinds of things and that's an opportunity for him and for us. So, yeah. um, and before we dive into the book, did you have any thoughts about what sister was saying? Um, I was just thinking about vulnerability too, and how um, just the willingness to be injured and how so often we protect ourselves um, from going to that place and <clears throat> letting go of all of those defenses we can have, you know, if we're in our devout prayer life and in even white knuckling, as you said, Claire, um, sometimes we can just be so unaware of what those, those places are where we're not willing to go into that vulnerability, that willing to be injured. And so it's just, I think it's really beautiful how um, in the book, it just kind of, you just kind of start breaking it down for us and really open up those places. So you can start to discover where those are, those parts of yourself are that you don't want to go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Cause I, that's, I, that's such, that's so true. And for all of us. And I, I think just the way that Jesus, I have, what I find about Christ, one of the things I think is so beautiful about him and it's that he's so incredibly kind. He is so incredibly respectful and kind. And he has no desire to like shatter us or destroy us or he's so kind. And, and all he, all he does is he invites, he just, he invites into his own life and and so like, that's the, like, and like what we're talking about, like that, like what you're saying right there is like, it's the invitation to being seen. Like it's the invitation to being hungry in the best way possible. It's the invitation to be naked. It's an invitation to be like him. And he's so patient, <laughs> so patient with us and how he leads us on this journey that we don't, we don't even have to do it alone to figure it out. He's not like giving us a map and saying, well, good luck. I'll see you on Easter. You know, he's, he's leading us into the desert and and just gently revealing what we can handle when we can handle it. It's just so wonderful. Yeah. And it's so interesting too, because that kindness is something like either others have beaten us up, you know, whether interiorly or even physically, or we beat ourselves up. Gosh. And there's so much shame yes. that we carry 
And that kindness is like, it's like a brand new concept sometimes because we have these false images of the father and who he is. And so it's kind of allowing, I think this, you know, during Lent, we can try to open that up and allow these new, you know, truths about who God is Mm -hmm. when we start to take away some of the things that are in the way. I did an eight day silent retreat with father Boniface earlier this, or this last year. And and one of the, he told me many wise things, as you know, he's very wise, but one of the things that he shared with me that I've been sharing with people ever since was that he said, you know, God, the father's old enough that we can all be his children. And it means I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to grow up. Like I can just be little and I can make mistakes and I can fall down and I can get back up. And, and it's his kindness that unlocks our heart. Like it's the kindness of God, the the tender strength of God that unlocks our hearts. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I'm jumping ahead, but when you said tender, mm-hmm. that section on tenderness, sister. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. That the strength, the the gentleness, the strength, the healing power of tenderness. Yes. Um actually, okay, Father Boniface, you were talking about my beloved Bishop Olmstead. Oh, and you were saying how tender he yes. is. And that resonated with me because it's absolutely true. When you're in his presence or when you're in the presence of somebody that is so filled with the love of God, it's like there is nobody else but you in the entire world. They're so, there's nothing else. They're just present to you. And just the fact that they're present to you is healing. They don't have to do or say anything. There's something about that that is incredibly powerful and it's strong, like you were saying. And, um, and that's just when we're healed and when we're whole, we can be that for other people. Mm -hmm. And that's really the point, isn't it? That we can love God and love others with a heart that's fully integrated, that's whole, and that's able to give the love of God as well as receive it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes. And amen. And amen to that. And that's the whole, it's, it's living Christ's life. It's, It's the very first paragraph of the catechism that says, you know, God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself and a plan of sheer goodness freely creates man to share in his own blessed life. Like God has no other ulterior motive than to bring us into his own beautiful life. And that's the point of like to restore means to bring back. It's not like going someplace you've never been before. So it's the goodness was there before the fall. The goodness was there before the trauma. The goodness was there, you know, before the pain and before the rupture of relationship, it's all there, which is why John Paul II says, all of us have an echo of the garden in our hearts. And so the Lord's art, the Lord is bringing us home. (laughs) That's, that's really all he's doing. And, and I think, you know, I love that you said that Claire, because I think all of us have a particular relationship with tenderness. Isn't it so interesting how it can be so scary to us at times it can be it can incite all kinds of things in our hearts. And, and yet ultimately it's the tenderness that quiets a, a baby as, as the baby cries. It's the mama's tenderness. It's the soothing voice. It's the Peter sitting down with Jesus at the charcoal fire and Jesus being tender with him. You know, it's the woman caught in adultery. It's the woman hemorrhaging. It's Talitha Kum. It's all the things, you know, it's yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. and, uh, Go ahead, Anne. I was just going to say what's coming up for me too, is like how just a question for everyone to ponder is in your own prayer life with the Lord, are you, you know, do you feel worthy to receive that tenderness? Mm. Just to think about that, take that to the Lord and, and just, um, you know, if there's anything there that stirs up for you regarding that, it's a really big one. Mm. That's a good word. Mm -hmm. Well, the journey to wholeness Mm -hmm. is uh, we begin it with prayer. And so to, you know, the church gives us that as like a pillar for every Lenten season, Mm -hmm. being the good mother that she is. And so you begin the book, inviting everybody to consider prayer and what it actually is. So can you speak to that sister a little bit about what is prayer and how do we begin a life of prayer if we don't already have one? And, And even if we do, do we actually understand what true uh, prayer is. Yeah. I think, well, prayer is our relationship with God. It's communion. It's, it's our, it's our relationship with him. It's our, the manifestation of our, our love with him. And it's lived out like Paul says, you know, to to pray without ceasing. He's not, he's not just speaking of rote prayers. He's speaking about our lives being immersed in his. And, 
when we talk about prayer as a, a means of healing, it heals um, all of the rupture, like prayer, that intimacy with God heals the rupture in our relationship with him, where we in the garden turned away from God, where, you know, the original Dr. Bob Schutz talks about how like the original, the original sin is really the rupture of that relationship. Like it's, it's many things. It's, it's, it's the, the source and the consequence of it. It's like the rupture of the relationship of turning away from the one who knows us, the one who is our life source, the one who reveals us to ourselves the one to whom um, everything exists within. And so prayer in our lives, that is the foundation of our entire life. It, it is personal prayer. It's communal prayer. It's sacramental prayer. Um, it's a sacrament of the church. But that relationship, first and foremost, is going to be the foundation for everything else, everything else in our life. It's, it's very difficult. And I'm not saying that because I'm a nun. I'm just, <laughs> it's like true. So, I mean, that's the, the reality of, of if we're really made in the image and likeness of God and, and we belong to him, and he belongs to us, then what other life source is there? Then I'm going to, I'm going to seek life through something else. Like Saint, like uh, C.S. Lewis says, our idols are event, eventually break us, right? We're, we're all seeking life. We're all seeking to live through a person. So we can live through Christ, or we can try to live through our kids or live through our spouse or live through our academic degrees or live through all the things we do, Instagram, like all the things we do just because our hearts are so hungry and they're so broken, but it's Christ who desires to bring us home you know, St. Paul says, you know, now we see dimly as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. And I just liken him to always, I just liken him to the, the person in our life that keeps calling us back to himself saying, look here, like when, a, you know, a child's having a meltdown in the grocery store, mom's like, mama, and mom's like, all right, honey, look here, look here, look here, look here, look here, look at mama, look at mama, you're okay, you're okay. And the kid will look away and she'll just gently bring his gaze back to her. And I really, that's in many ways, like what Jesus does with us. He's like, you look here, because I'm going to reveal to you who I am and who you are. And you won't be able to find that anywhere else. You see it, you see it mediated through other people who bear that source, but nobody can give us what Christ can give us. And so the journey of wholeness and communion is, is not like, so my pain stops that that's part of it. It's like the, the trauma and the lies, those things are, are walked through with Christ over and over again. And so the, the resonance of them decreases as the truth and grace increases, but, but the, the purpose of all of it is to, to live and to love like Christ. Like, how are we supposed to do that? How are we supposed to do that when our lives are so fragmented and disintegrated in, unless we come back to the one who could, the only one who can make us whole. And like, that's what Pope Benedict says that, you know, it's, it, that's healing expresses the entire content of redemption. He says that it's, that's what it is. And it's only in Christ that sees us in our wholeness and it's his love that makes us whole. I remember one time I was on an airplane with my then probably one-year-old little guy, Daniel, and we were descending and there was all this turbulence. I mean, it was the kind of turbulence where like the carts are rolling around and the pilots getting on and everybody sit down and you're grabbing the, you know, the side of your seat. And my little boy did not know what was going on. Like his eyes were so big. And I remember just leaning over and I just looked at him and I smiled and I just kept his gaze and he smiled and like everything was chaos around us, but mama said it was okay. I love it. So it was yeah. okay. And I always remember that because that to me, that's like how that you lock gazes with the Lord and you just know he's got it under control and life can just be a storm around you. Mm -hmm. But as long as you stay centered on the one who loves you, it's okay. The problem is staying centered. And I think <laughs> yeah, the key is yeah. prayer, right? And the key is, is yeah. that daily relationship and keeping that relationship alive. So what would you say, sister, to somebody that might be not used to having like a daily practice of prayer? How do we begin that relationship with God if that's not something that we have made part of our day? You know, I, I'm always a, a big about just the simple little thing. I would say just start somewhere, just start somewhere and start small. Like, and if you can do the small thing regularly, that means you can do larger things regularly. And maybe for Lent, it's like picking up a Magnificat and just reading the gospel for the day. Like just, just read the gospel for all of Lent and, you know, and just see what happens. It is maybe just sitting in quiet. So for, and even just start with 10 minutes. So for 10 minutes, you're going to put your phone away and then just sit with the Lord and just ask the Lord to speak to you. Maybe like put on some quiet music or people, people pray differently, whether it's a, a favorite scripture passage you have or some spiritual reading, but it's the, um, I really don't think you can replace the silence. I think silence is very, very important. So I think there's, there's moments of silence for that, but it, or it is praying the rosary. There's so many different forms of prayer, but that there's a part of it that for me, it transcends beyond anything we say into the realm of our being where we are just with the Lord. And that that's the kind of 
like when you spend time with the, somebody that you love that sometimes you say things, sometimes you don't, sometimes you guys go out and have fun. Sometimes you just hang out, but it's like in being like you're saying, Claire, like being in the presence, like locking gaze with the Lord. But those, the thing about any sort of discipline in our life or any sort of practice in our life, those things don't just happen. And it's not romantic, but we're going to have to make, we're going to have to actually set a time to make that happen. And it's going to have to happen whether, you know, it's convenient or not. And so we're just, and if we fail, we're going to come back again. But I, you know, sometimes it's, it's like easy, like all of us, oh, I'm going to get up and I'm going to eat this and I'm going to go for a 12 mile run, and, you know, and then it's kind of like by seven o'clock, you haven't done any of it. So it's like, what, what are the priorities of my day? And some people pray best in the morning. Some people pray best at noon, some people pray best at night, or maybe it's when your kid's napping and you're just going to do the best you can. I say, go for it. Like, at some point, but that has to be something that we, and that is a discipline, like that root word DISC means student. And so we are always a student. We're always, the disciplines help make, make us students. And so we're always a student of the Lord. So we're always learning. So all these things, it's, they're, they're going to have to be things we actually have. We have to make them happen in a sense of they have to be a priority to us. Yeah. Would you say that the healing journey happens in the midst of that prayer and that it, with the point of like really continuing and persevering in the dry periods and the periods when we don't sense God, but just showing up that that's really key to like the deeper work of healing that mm -hmm. the Lord will do, but it's really going to take us showing up day after day. Oh, yes. It happens in all of it. Yes, it happens in all of it and the joy and the sorrow and the dryness and the richness and the, and the desolation, and the consolation, it's all, we, we keep showing up and, and we keep walking toward, and we keep allowing the Lord to come and find us and to come and rescue us. Yes. I, that is the part of the, just the healing journey of, of having our loves rightly ordered, having our lives rightly ordered by the Lord. And, you know, it's, you know, that people kind of colloquially say, you know, nobody on their deathbed ever said, I wish I spent more time at the office, you know? And so it's like that time with God is never wasted. It's just, it's just never wasted. And, um, yeah, the healing always happens because he's the healer. Christ is the healer. So whenever we're in his presence, healing always happens. The next section of the book, when it talks about fasting, sister, it talk about healing the relationship with ourselves. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah. So what we see, like in the, like I was alluding to earlier in the garden is in the rupture of relationship with God, Adam and Eve are broken in three, some play, some say four, but three major ways. So they're broken in the relationship with God. They're broken in their relationship with themselves. So their, their wills are weakened, their intellects are dark and their, their emotions are, are put out of order. So there's like a chaos within. Um, and then they're also broken in the relationship with the others in creation. And so we all know, we can all say with St. Paul of I don't do what I want to do and what, what, what I want to do. I don't do it. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so like we all, we all know that war within ourselves, within our members. Like we know the war intellectually, you know, spiritually, physically, you know, emotionally, sexually, we know all the within us. We know all those areas of our life that we are often at war with ourselves. And so what fasting does is fasting helps order our loves. Right. So, and we can fast. And I talk in the book about a lot of different things. Like we can fast from a lot of different things, but when we allow the Lord to choose that for us and we experience the ache of that, or we experience like the absence of one thing, what it allows us to do is allows us to fill that place in our heart with, with God, with something larger. And it also helps us to see our idols. Like, you know, it's interesting. We've all tried it probably at times things were like, Oh, that's not a big deal. If I gave that up and you give it up and like two days later, you are dying. And you're like, I had no idea that was such a part of whatever, whether it's food, whether, whatever it is, whatever it is. And so that helps open our hearts to see, okay, Lord, what am I, what am I looking to save myself instead of you? Like, where am I, where am I focusing my gaze? What am I you know, putting my weight on that I'm looking at to, to fill the hunger. Or when I get, when I start to feel uncomfortable, one, one of my dear priest friends says, you know, when you start to feel uncomfortable, do you open your phone or do you close your eyes? Like, what are, what are the things like in our hearts where we go when we start to feel uncomfortable? And so fasting, it brings us into discomfort in a sense of there's a spiritual practice to it. Cause Jesus says, you know, there's certain things that are only cast out through prayer and fasting, but like the underneath level of that is to help bring us into integration. So it orders our loves. And so that we can, and then when our loves are ordered, we can enjoy what is good, true, and beautiful. We can enjoy the richness. We can enjoy the beauty. We can enjoy love and pleasure and symphony. And, and, but until our loves are ordered, we're always going to be grasping at those things. or We're going to be either pushing them away because they seem dangerous or so fasting is a wonderful, gosh, it's such a wonderful discipline, right? For the, as students to have Jesus order our loves. 
My husband thinks I'm crazy, but I love that watching the show Hoarders. Oh, isn't it like, yes, I've seen that many times. It's like therapy for me. I just yeah. watch it and I look at these poor people, but it's, it's a visual representation of sin for all of us. Mm-hmm. It's just a very visual way to see what happens when we cram stuff yes. into our lives that we do mm-hmm. not need. And we cling to so desperately because we think we do, because what mm-hmm. if, like, what if you yes. take this away? I don't want to find out. Yes. And then when it's over, I'm like crying because the house is clean and it's spacious. I think about that scripture. The Lord will bring us to a spacious place. Yeah. And like you can exhale and you can experience life and you can experience love and you can bring other, there's room for other people now, finally, where before it was just, that's a good word, Mm -hmm. garbage, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's what comes to mind when you're talking about right ordering and making space. And then the beauty is God multiplies that space. And it's like St. Teresa of Avila says, it's like your heart expands from within. It's like that well within you. And it just, it just grows and grows and extends Mm -hmm. outward. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And amen. And I, I love that you just talked about that show of hoarders, because if you have a hoarding addiction, it's not about the stuff it's about what it represents. And so for us watching that show, you know, people are trying to help the person and, and we're like, Oh my gosh, just get rid of it. But that person's having, sometimes they have panic attacks, like, because like what you're saying. And so it's really what, you know, when Jesus comes to us and he's inviting us to surrender those things to him, you know, it's, it's amazing what we, even with the Lord are afraid to surrender at times, because like you're saying, I'm afraid I'm not going to live without it. Like I'm afraid of what I'm going to die. Like if I have to face this feeling of abandonment or rage or control, or if I have to face these things, I might not survive. And, and Jesus is just gently knocking on the door of our house saying, would you, would you allow me to come in? And can we look at these things together? Like I'm not going to, and and it's really beautiful because in those shows, the therapists never force the people to clean their house. They never do it. And no, they, they say we can't do that. Yeah, which is it has yeah. to be them doing it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sister, we'll have to you'll have to come over and watch with me sometime. <laughs> My husband will not. He's like, why in the world would you want to watch somebody? <laughs> no, it is it, but it's, it's it is great. Fascinating it's, to me. It's yes. such a study. Yep, I do agree with you. Yes. And I think what it comes down to is trust. Yes. You have to trust that when you need what, whatever it is that the Lord will provide it instead of grasping and clinging to something just in case, yeah. whatever that is, or you're trying to fill our life with something because we're afraid of being without mm-hmm. when, if everything's rightly ordered and we give everything its rightful place in our life, we can trust that the Lord will provide at at, it, at the time. Um, maybe yes. not. And you know, not, maybe not before it's usually just what we need when we need it. Mm -hmm. but it really comes down to trust. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And I I think even the word trust means to rely upon somebody or to depend Mm -hmm. upon them. And it really gives like the kind of the intimation of I'm going to put my weight upon you. Are you, are you, can I put my weight upon you? And for us, that's very, we're very afraid of that. And Bob, Dr. Bob talks about how, you know, that so if you look at the tree, like the tree of our life and the root of our tree of like the knowledge of good and evil, all of us, you know, have a root of sin in our life. And, and the, the, at the root of that is usually self-reliance where I'm going to, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to depend on myself. I'm going to save myself. I'm going to do it myself. Um, and then the, the shift of that is the root of the tree of the life, the root of the tree of life, which says, I will let God love me in the places I feel most vulnerable and most dependent. Right. I will let God love me in the places I feel most vulnerable and most dependent. And just many times sitting in our life when the Holy Spirit reveals something to us that he would like to receive from us or that he would like to transform in our life or a memory in our life he would like to go into or something in our life that's continually troubling to us or a repetitive pattern of sin, whatever. It's just so easy for us to like Adam and Eve, try to seize the fruit for ourselves and try to, you know, maintain some sort of autonomy, which is not even possible, but that versus like sitting with the Lord saying, Lord, I'm terrified. And it's okay to be afraid. Like, like you're saying, like, it's, it's okay. Like this Lenten journey is we're going to, there's going to some things that are going to come to our heart that are going to to, They're going to scare us. And and that's okay. Like Jesus is not afraid. And he's like, can I just sit here with you? Like, can I just, can I be here with you in this? Can I be here and with you? Why this particular fasting is so hard? Like, can I be here with you in this relationship that you have with your mother? That's so broken that you wish for something so different. Can I be here with you? That's Christ wants to be with us. And like we were saying earlier, wherever, wherever Christ is, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, wherever Christ is, there's healing, you know, always. Mm. And did you want to chime in? There was a quote 
that struck both of us that I wanted to get into on page 63, the quote from the exorcist that you said you think about every day. I think I will think about it every day. That's a good one. Um, But before we dive in, Anne, did you have anything? No, I just have to admit my guilty obsession was my 800 pound life. The, that show. <laughs> That's another one. I know it's like we watch the same it show. It fascinates me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's yeah. The study in my, of humanity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It does. So true. So Let's true. Let's get into that quote, Claire. I love that quote too. Do you want to read it? Do you uh, have it? I have it on my screen. Do you have it on paper? I have it on. I'm a paper. Sister, we didn't get the actual hard copies of the book yet. Okay. They were trying to send it to us, but you know how the mail is these days. So I we know. didn't get it. So just forgive me just a moment. Let me find it. Oh, or Anne, if you have it pulled there. up. Should I share it? Yeah. You want to share it then? Let me see if I share can share it and read it. It's a little long. So this is, a, this is um, from the second week of Lent and sisters talking about the ache for communion. Mm-hmm. And um, the, this quote from an exorcist friend of hers Mm -hmm. that is so powerful and so striking and so true. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read it sister? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sorry. It wasn't. Yeah, sure. Um, And these, oh, these are the words of my friend. And he says, after so many years of working with people and their deepest wounds, sins and sorrows, I've come to realize a couple things about the nature of the battle we face on earth. First, our wounds are not arbitrary. They are not random. Satan is like a sniper. He intuits with his angelic intellect, the destiny of every human person, and he shoots his deadly arrows into the place that will do the most damage in order to thwart the flourishing of the person and God's plan for their life. Satan succeeds when he can convince us to hate God, hate ourselves, and hate the wounds, hate others for the wounds we bear. But second, in God's mysterious and divine sovereignty, God allows Satan this access only to make the wounded places even more life-giving more beautiful, more glorious than they would have ever been otherwise. If we allow the restoration of these places, even Satan's most vicious attacks are nothing in comparison to the immense sovereignty and love of God and the profound transformation that can take place. Yeah, that quote just, I I have literally thought of it um, pretty much every day since father told me that. And it's amazing to talk about that and to see people's faces when we think about you know, many times if, so I'm just going to ask you just for a second in your heart, if for all of us here today, if you could recall with Jesus, what are some of your deepest wounds? Like, and if you're very honest and some of them might be hard to think of, and I'm just going to invite you just with the Lord, if you can just think of some of your deepest wounds, whether that's, they were wounds that were self-inflicted, they were wounds from mom and dad, they were wounds from other people in your life. There were, there's sicknesses, it's death, it's divorce, it's abuse. It's just being overlooked a lot. Maybe, you know, you were one of many kids and you just felt like nobody ever saw you all these things. And to understand that in those places, many times we harbor shame and we, we harbor self-hatred against ourselves many times in our deepest wounds, but to understand that those wounds that were inflicted upon us, especially in childhood, those wounds are not random. (laughs) They're not arbitrary that the enemy has an enemy has done this. And Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he is trying to take us out. And so I think that just understanding that these are not places where Jesus hates us. These are not places that disqualify us from his love. Like these are, these are the very places that he, the Lord so deeply delights to come into these places and the the places where the enemy wants to destroy us. It's the places where we experience the love of Christ. And it's in these places where we give the love of Christ in a fragrance that nobody else can give, but us through these very places. It's it's, it is the, the Christian paradox. It is from the deepest death comes the greatest life. And that's, that's true. It's just, so I think that staggering reality kind of helps us reshift how we see ourselves and also our wounds, but also how do we, you know, allow the Lord to come. So instead of pretending they're not there or pretending everybody else has issues and they should work on them, but we're fine, which is just one of our self-defense mechanisms that to be like, okay, Lord, what are the places where, where love has been interrupted? Where are the places where I am self-reliant? What are the places where I have really some severe self-defense mechanisms and just some, you know, some protectors, some, you know, really places where I'm just not going to let anybody in where I've made vows. Like nobody can be trusted. I'll never be well. I will never be seen. I'm nobody understands me. All the things that just our hearts ache, but it's in those very places where Jesus comes to transform us in, in a very unique way. So yeah, that's a, that's a deeply profound reality that I think I know for me has really transformed 
my areas of deepest wilderness. I'm like, oh, that that wasn't random. Yeah, that was. Oh, Sister, that was would you thing. talk a little bit about protectors and just a t- titch of IFS for yeah. our listeners? Yeah. I mean, we use the word protectors in a therapy system called the internal family systems, where it talks about these are the the parts of our hearts that try to keep us safe. So many, it's the places where we control or it's the places where we dominate or we criticize, or we have to have it all together, or we have a kind of persona, like a persona that protects the tender, vulnerable places inside. Right. So if you could look at kind of like the armor, like the armor that protects the the vulnerabilities inside. And, and those are what, what are called like the exiles, like the places where we hold areas of deep pain or neediness or sorrow or grief or shame, like all the places that are very tender, that don't feel like safe enough at many times to allow Christ to come or anybody else to come close to. So most of us, and we all have it kind of operating in different ways in our life. And we can all see in ourselves probably in different relationships, like, Oh, okay. You know, but it's those places that are very tender that don't feel safe enough yet to come and just be. And so we, we massively you know, protect them. And so that's a lot of times that's what we're doing in our life through through a variety of methods. Um, but yeah, they're pretty formidable when, and just, it's lovely that the Lord doesn't, he doesn't tire of visiting us there. (laughs) I love that concept and having no background in psychology or therapy or even healing ministry actually through father Boniface and the the program at St. Vincent for spiritual direction, I was introduced to this idea Oh yeah. And just praying with it has been Mm. incredibly powerful Mm -hmm. in this idea because it is the fracturing, like original sin fractures our relationship with God, fractures our relationship with other people, and it splinters us inside. Yeah. And I had this realization that, you know, the good shepherd, he doesn't only go out to bring us back as individuals, but he searches out all the little parts of us that we have pushed away and that we have buried and that, you know, their little voices, you know, we just try to stifle them, but he wants to bring them home. And I thought it was so beautiful. I was looking at you making this motion and there's the image of the Trinity like right there so perfectly because that's our home. Yeah. Like this is the home that God is preparing for us with many room and there is room for all of our parts and it's right here where he dwells within us. Mm -hmm. And just that idea of like bringing it all back, integrating it back into the place where he is. I love it. I think I could just, I'm so grateful to be introduced to this idea. And I find that taking it to prayer has been incredibly fruitful. Oh gosh. Oh, I love that. Thank you for speaking to that. I agree with you. Yes, I agree with you. It's, it is helpful. And, and you see that I really, you see that all of us have those little girl or little boy places inside, you know, and, and all the things that we bear and. I was very convicted by the Lord um, some time ago from, from that scripture passage when the, the children are coming to him so that he would touch them and so that he could bless them and play, lay his hands. So the parents are bringing their children to Jesus so he can place his hands on him because his touch is safe and it's healing. And the disciples are rebuking them. And I, I love that Jesus says, you don't do that. Don't, you don't, don't do that. <laughs> but you let the little children come to me because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And then he placed his hands on them and he blessed them. And we all have those little children inside. And most of the time we're the disciples, we're rebuking those places inside. And we're so deeply harsh on ourselves. And, I, and I'm not talking about, you know, being permissive with things that, you know, need to be transformed, I'm not talking about that, but just the heart, we are, we are the, we are the, you know, just rebuking the little parts of us. And we're like, get out of here. You're causing so much problems in my life. Like get away. And Jesus is just saying, you, you let them come to me. You, you let every single one of them come to me because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them and it belongs to you and don't do not prevent them. And if we did nothing else this line, other than just allow the little places, the little aches of our hearts to come to the Lord, whoo, that would be transformative indeed. Yeah. I, it reminds me of another passage that you quote later in the book um, from the gospel of John, where Mary's anointing the feet of Jesus and Judas is like, what is she doing? And the Lord says, leave her alone. Yes. Yeah. Leave her alone. That that's the passage that I've really hung on to. And I think it's just, it expresses that desire of the Lord for all those voices to be silenced, that he does desire intimacy with us and healing for us and, and to um, rebuke even our own voices that tell us it's not for you. It's mm-hmm. for everybody else, but it's not for you. It must not be for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Oh, that's so powerful and so beautiful. Yes, Clary. Yep. 
Before we move on, Anna and I were really struck by um, the idea of re- restoration and what that actually means. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Anne, do you want to hop in or? Yeah, and did you want to say something earlier? I was actually just going to shift what was really interesting is these parts and these places that I know I've experienced. Um, sometimes it's just too hard to go there by yourself. And I was just thinking about how important community is and or sometimes when you go into a healing retreat and to have the power of other people witnessing those pain, that pain um, that Christ uses them to help you go to that place because it may be incredibly difficult mm-hmm. for someone to, yes. to actually go there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of the next section of the book is mm-hmm. the community piece of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, and that's very true. And I, I, um, I love that you said that both of you, because it's, I was, I was on the, um, a call or I was like kind of in a class, a master class on the healing of trauma this last summer. And, and one of the, there were therapists from all over the world and there, it wasn't a Christian. It was just like a purely secular neurolo- neurological kind of scientific study of trauma and healing of trauma. And the beautiful thing is that every single one of them said, you know, what heals trauma it's communion. <laughs> Like that's the only thing that heals trauma is communion. It's not even a modality. It's actually communion, which is what happens, say, even in a therapy office where you can sit with somebody and experience some deep emotion and go through some deep areas of shame in your life and things that have happened to you. And it's in a safe place. And when you come back kind of set to yourself and you look at the therapist's face, they, they, they see you and they, and they love you and it regulates you and it, and it brings communion. It's the, it's the, it's the repair of the rupture, you know, and that's, that's the, that's what holy connection, that's what holy attachment, like those are secure attachments. Like that's how we grow is through secure attachments of, of strong, warm, loving connection. That's how our hearts grow. And that's how God relates to us. Like our connection is ultimately with him. And so in the area of almsgiving, that's what almsgiving does. And we talk about almsgiving is traditionally giving money to something or giving clothes or things like that, but it's much more than that. It's really the gift. Like you're saying, even the gift of presence, most people, you know, shockingly enough, don't want our unsolicited advice. (laughs) Like they just, you know, it's surprising. They just want us to listen to them. They just want, they want us to be with them. And that rupture of our relationships with others, which we see in every aspect of our life, like that's a, a, a deep area that the Lord desires to bring wholeness and communion to. And so the giving of alms, the giving of ourselves, the giving of, of forgiveness, which is the whole week dedicated to true, what true forgiveness is the, you know, the admonishing the sinner of righting the wrongs of counseling the doubtful, like all those things, like those are great gifts that we offer to, to bring to the Lord healing and communion. And so we're not meant to live solitary lives. Christianity is a fellowship. It's not an, a solitary journey. I, I like to think about the topic of spiritual motherhood mm-hmm. and how women in particular, I mean, all of us are called to this life-giving kind of love, yeah. but women in particular just have um, a capacity to bring life to the other spiritually, emotionally. Um, and it's not limited to, you know, the physical mothers, but to yeah. the women in our lives who give birth to us in so many ways, yes. like you. Oh. <laughs> like, like the women, you know, in your order. And I know so many of them and they just, yeah. um, just to be with you is life-giving. Mm. So. Thank you. Yeah. But I did, I did, like Anne said, I loved the, uh, the way, the angle that you took with the almsgiving is it's really self-gift. Mm-hmm. It's not just, yeah. you know, money, tithing, you know, giving away, um, but it's, but within all of that, it's really the idea that I'm giving of myself to you. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by, um, like the, the gift of our presence. Yeah. (laughs) It sounds simple and easy. And yet life is so busy. We are so used to multitasking Mm -hmm. and listening with one ear or, you know, doing two things at one time. And as a mom, I am so the Lord so often convicts me of my sin in that area of not being fully present to my people. Mm-hmm. And so that part of your book really uh, is something I want to pray with this Lent. That might be my something I really need to work on is just being available, mm-hmm. um, not necessarily having noise on, just having that space around me that they can come to me, my kids, you know, especially in the evenings, and just that I'm there and that I'm fully present and that I'm not trying to do two things, but I turn and I look them in the eye, yeah. eyes, and I'm just 
there for them. Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, that was really, really powerful for me, Mm. a reminder. Oh gosh. Thank you for sharing that. That's so beautiful and so true. Oh gosh. That's so true. Yeah. It does. Like you said, it sounds easy, but it's, it's shockingly difficult (laughs) to really be present to somebody and not think in your head, what you want to say, why they're saying it, or try to find a better argument or like try to fix their problem for them, but just to be present. Oh my goodness. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Or just finish that one last thing. (laughs) I mean, how many times a day I'm like, just a second. (laughs) I'll be right there. Yeah. 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 I'm sure. Claire, I better guess I, I'm going to stop calling you in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Anne. <laughs> yeah, well, in this presence, this communion, and like, I guess we could go back to that restoration comment, Claire. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was at uh, Boundaries group the other night and oh, yeah. um, our our leader said, you know, transformation isn't, it's not, it's not just changed because you can always change back, but it's transformation is sealed. Like it's complete. Yeah. Right. She told me that I was like, Ooh, write that down. That's a good word. Yeah. Yeah. And just, well, Claire had a really great analogy too, just about how it's stronger. Claire, go ahead. Well, it was in the context of, um, restoration, Mm-hmm. transformation, restoration. And again, I love my Bishop. I'm going to, I quote him all the time, but he was saying in the, we were talking about marriage and healing in a meeting once. And he said, he said, I grew up on a farm and we were always like, things were always breaking. Right. So the tractors, the, the, the tools, the things would break and then we would weld them back together. Mm-hmm. And he said, when it was repaired, it was always much stronger than it had been in the beginning. And he said, that's really the biblical meaning of restoration. It's, it's mm-hmm. like a recreation, but it's making it better than it was before. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean, okay, we're going to go back to the garden mm-hmm. and we're going to be just like Adam and Eve. No, 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 yeah. no, no. Mm-hmm. With the coming of Christ, mm-hmm. all of that was elevated to so mm-hmm. much more. Mm-hmm. And so it's that, oh, happy fault that, and, and it, and that, that quote from the exorcist was saying that you know, Satan is strategic. Mm -hmm. He can see the way that God has designed you so beautifully and so perfectly in those areas that the world so desperately needs you and your gifts. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. he will take aim exactly there. So those are the wounded places that God will come in. And then you're not like damaged goods where it's like you're, you're crippled now. Yeah. No, no, no. When he enters those places and restores them, like the farm tools, Yes. You can be used in a way that you could not have been used even in God's original design for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that to me is so staggering and so full of hope. It's like, no, it's in those wounded places. God actually intends to resurrect something mm-hmm. uh, even greater than his original design. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just so good. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's a good word. Claire preach girl preach. Cause that, <laughs> that yeah, that's, that is, that's a good, that's a good word. And that that's true. That, that's how, you know, even psychologists say, when you talk about like parents and like attunement and attachment, you know, like if you can just get it right half the time and repair the other half, you're, you're doing fine. Like just, it's the repair. It is the repair that makes the difference. Like it's the repair of, of coming back and having the connection healed and it's made stronger. And it is, it's like, you know, you think of Adam and Eve in the garden, then you think about Jesus crushing death and triumphing over it. And we're living forever in his glory. That's just like, what, you know, oh my gosh, like the, the, the stunning realization of that kind of grace is the beauty of it. Yeah. My goodness. And would you guys agree that, um, I know for me, I've definitely done this, but a lot of times we've been on that cross for so long and we just beg for the resurrection. We have a really hard time waiting in that tomb because going in that tomb, we got to descend into those feelings and go to those places. And that tomb really is that, that daily prayer that we need to go and keep encountering these places. And Mm -hmm. my spiritual director always says healing is like, um, in our wounds, it's like a diamond. Mm -hmm. And so you're just always shifting it. So the Holy spirit can shed light, just looking at it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, going back to those places, it just might be too hard Mm-hmm. Uh, to get off that cross and to, to wait in, in that space. And we just want the healing. We just want the resurrection. We know that's the promise. Mm-hmm. Um, so just the importance of supporting each other in that healing journey in this process mm-hmm. in prayer and, mm-hmm. and staying accountable to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's so true. I, I, people say we want to jump over Holy Saturday. We want to go from Good Friday to Easter Sunday. And we don't want to, and, and all of us, like you're saying, and so beautifully, all of us are constantly even living out the Paschal mystery in different parts of our hearts, like different facets of our life or 
in the life and some of us are in the crucifix some of us are in the death some of us are in the resurrection so it's like this the continual paschal mystery and i think like you said us coming alongside of each other and i think that's one of the beautiful things about love is and when we sit next to people and you know we're not trying to push them out of their their tomb either that we're sitting there with them and we're reminding them of who they are we're reminding them of who god is we're reminding them that they're not alone that we're with us we're with them that this is not the end of their story that we're and it's that that's the kind of real presence you know of what the lord comes to our tombs and he raises like lazarus you know he comes to our tomb and, and he raises us from them he doesn't try to pretend like he wasn't dead you know he just he raises him from that and so yeah that's we need each other it's we do we deeply need each other well i told you both before we started earlier today so we're just gonna let the holy spirit lead this and look he's led us all the way through holy week all of a sudden we're <laughs> yeah, at there we go. holy saturday and uh, I was telling Anne, we were talking, I said, I love Holy Saturday. Mm -hmm. I love the idea that when all looks dead yeah. and silent, and it looks like nothing is happening, which so often is a reflection sometimes of our prayer yeah. or what our interior light experiences, mm -hmm. the most powerful work is happening. And like Jesus Christ has descended and is breaking thousands of years Mm -hmm. of bondage and opening up mm -hmm. like eternity, but nobody knows it yet, Gosh, so you know? Yeah. And I think about him being in the tomb, but alive, like, like coming back to life in the tomb before he emerges, like just the power of that moment. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's our experience. It's like the Lord is there. He's right there with us. And yet it's all dark. Mm, yes. And, um, but the resurrection is at hand and, and, um, and that's the whole point. And that's a reflection of our experience with the Lord. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's the journey, right? Yeah. And that's, it's hard to believe we're talking about Lent actually. I mean, we just like, we still have Christmas ornaments laying around the house. So it's crazy, but it's, it's going to be upon us. Yeah. It's not too early to start mm -hmm. praying about what the Lord has for us. And these seasons yeah. are, these, these seasons have grace mm -hmm. that will never come again Amen. that are mm -hmm. offered. And it's, you know, it's an opportunity. So, mm -hmm. um, so we're almost done. I can't believe it. That was the fastest hour of my week. I don't know about the rest <laughs> of you. Um, and did you want to talk about some of the, um, other resources? We, well, first of all, the book, AveMariaPress.com. Mm -hmm can order the book. Um, I have a code for free shipping. We'll include it in the email. Yeah. We'll include the mm -hmm. links and everything. It's, it's restore in all caps mm -hmm. for free shipping. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to discuss the book or listen to a discussion of the mm -hmm. book, abiding together podcast.com mm -hmm. mm -hmm. sign up because sister and um, Michelle Benzinger and Heather Kim are going to be spending their Lent with us talking about the book. So what a great yeah. way to dive even deeper, mm -hmm. um, in this journey with them. Mm -hmm. I like the Lenten books that you're picking the last few years, by the way. Oh, go, yeah. Hey. <laughs> like too. yeah. Good yeah, stuff. It's, it's really beautiful. It really is the Holy spirit that chooses them. And it's just interesting to see. We usually every advent or every Lent for sure, but we, every advent we've, we've done a couple different things, but yeah, it's, and it's just the thing. I can't tell you how many times in our community, people like that is what I needed to read this Lent. I didn't know it. So yeah. Good. Well, I'll, I'll plug Claire. If anybody missed last year's abiding together study on St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, this so present good. paradise, yeah, you guys can go back and listen. Um, if you would like to enter into Lent with St. Elizabeth. Mm. Yeah. That rocked people's world last year. Claire, they loved it. It was, oh, just, she's, yeah, so good. she's my girl. Yeah. Yeah. So it was so good. So good on so many levels. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, and there's a course too. Did you want to talk about, and cause it's related to what we were talking about today coming yeah, up. At Owl Institute. Um, yeah. D Dr. Jeff Thompson has got a course coming up in May, May 2nd, um, St. John of the cross from healed psyche to divine union. Mm -hmm. And it touches on some of this healing stuff, uh, that we've been going through. It's the psychology of St. John of the cross. And um, he's also got, a, a, we have another webinar with him on the Avila Army site that we did a few months ago on mental prayer and attachment theory, if anyone wants to check that out. Yeah. Um, and if you're part of the Army um, at St. Gabriel level, you can always listen to the recording of this class as well. 
um, whenever you want on demand, but that if you want to take that class live, it's going to be May 2nd through June 13th. Oh, that's cool. And then we also have, because the life of healing, like we said, begins with prayer. So there's a study that endows offering with Stephanie Burke and Simone Riscala of endow on St. Teresa of Avila, the doctor of prayer. And so um, tune in for that. Sign up on spiritualdirection.com and you can get all the news about all the things and stay in the loop. Um, I think that's enough for now. <laughs> Sister, did you have any resources though? You're so well-read. And uh, did you have anything else you wanted to mention if people, besides your book, mm. want more? Well, I think that the, the book I recommend most to people is uh, the book by Dr. Bob Schuss called Be Healed. Yeah, that is the number one book I recommend across the nation. And it is a, a book on everything we talked about this evening. And he's a marriage and family therapist, Dr. Bob Schutz. He's been a therapist for over 40 years and just wonderful Catholic, holy man. And so that, that was a great book. He also recently released a book called Be Restored, which is about the particular areas of sexual brokenness as well. And so all of us have areas of brokenness in our masculine and femininity. And if that's something that you really feel like maybe this Lent, the Lord's asking you to just journey with him in that, I would highly recommend Be Restored as well. Like they're just out, all of his books are great, but those two especially are outstanding. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Do we want to have a little Q and a, do you, do you, do you have a little bit more time I'm or you got to run? Yeah. All right. Yeah. If anyone has any questions for sister, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll just do a few minutes of a Q and a here. If you guys can, is the chat open? I guess we just wowed everyone so much that there's no, <laughs> there are no questions. <laughs> Do you attend 12 step meetings? I've I have attended many 12 step meetings in my life. Yes. And I've heard a lot of wisdom in those rooms. Yeah. I've heard some interesting things as well, but I've heard a lot of wisdom. And I, every time I've gone to a 12 step meeting, I've always heard something that I needed to hear. And so I've never regretted it. So those are, and if you could, there's some are better than others. So if you find a really good 12 step meeting for whatever is your particular sorrow in your life or the place you want to grow the most, I would, I would highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you have any healing retreats scheduled? People are yes. So I do a lot of work with the John Paul II Healing Center. So if you go to our website, it's jpiihealingcenter.org. You will find all of our upcoming uh, retreats. We have retreats for priests. We have retreats for lay people. We also take the retreat across the nation. It's called Healing the Whole Person. So um, I don't know where we'll be in the coming months, but, uh, we'll be in several places in 2022. We have a marriage retreat happening this weekend, um, on it's, you can go in person or virtual. So if you check out their website, you can jump on the live stream. Bob's gives one marriage retreat a year. So that it's really great. So yeah, we always have a lot of wonderful things, um, going on. Uh, so Go yes. ahead, Anne. Go ahead. Sue asked about the boundaries meeting. That's something um, I do here locally. But if you would like it virtually, maybe we could do it through AV soon. So I learned all about boundaries through Anne. You're like my personal boundaries coach. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I love boundaries. I think that's I like every third word that. you say. But I, uh, we need it. Yeah, especially people like me. I have no boundaries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome to the club. I'm a recovering codependent. So there you go. How would I know what Jesus is calling me to during Lent? It's confusing knowing if it's my voice or his. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure Father Boniface could give you some steps for <laughs> discernment. <laughs> That's I, I another hour long conversation. <laughs> you could. Um, I think, you know, sitting with the Lord and looking at the fruit of that. So what, what would be the fruit of it? Noticing what happens in your heart when that stirs in your heart. Um, and then maybe kind of listing it down, like what, what the Lord might be asking of you and just kind of noticing where your heart rests with those things. And I, I, if you don't have a spiritual director, I would talk to a good friend because friends can often help us see the things we need to see. And they, they might be able to look at the list and say, Hey, you know, what do you think about this? And they're like, Oh girl, it's about time. You know? So I think that's a really good idea, but it would always look at the fruit of it. So what are the fruits of that particular area? Even if it's hard. So even if there's choppy water up here, if, if sometimes, you know, we can know the Lord's asking us to do something and, and on the surface, it can be a bit of turmoil, but our heart is peace. 
we know we're like, oh, I know this is what the Lord's asking me to do. Uh, I think it's important for us. So just to notice that, you know, and the the Lord is always speaks in order and balance. So the Lord is never going to ask us to do something chaotic or something that would endanger us also as well. So to kind of notice that as well. So the Lord's very simple and he's very good and he speaks in, in line with himself. Amen. How do you find a spiritual director? Um, you guys can probably answer that question. <laughs> hey, go to three of them right here. I can see three of them. Spiritualdirection.com. We have a download. 10 steps to finding a spiritual director. Yes, we do. First step, pray. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ask the Lord. Um, and Claire, is that resource of easily available on the site somewhere? Do you know? You know what? Go to spiritualdirection.com and just Google 10 steps. And it'll, okay. to, speaking of 10 steps. Um, to finding a spiritual director. And it's just ideas. It's just a starting point, but yeah, at the beginning is to pray and ask the Lord. He wants it for you more than you want it for yourself. Amen. If he's put the desire on your heart, it comes with it a promise that he will fulfill that in his time and, and in his way. So be faithful to that. Mm-hmm. And like um, sister, you were saying in the meantime, like good spiritual mm-hmm. friends and mentors yes. and small groups, things like that are just irreplaceable in our spiritual life. We are made for communion. Like it, it is, yep. it's necessary. You're not meant to go at this alone. Mm-hmm. So just persevere. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lord is raising up more spiritual directors. So like, hang on, yeah. <laughs> they're coming father. There was like 20 some in our last class. So That's awesome. um, yeah, it's, it's exciting to see it is a movement of the Holy spirit and along with healing and mm-hmm. along with all of these amazing ministries that are that are coming to light. It's a movement of the Holy spirit. I think to, it's another element of healing spiritual direction. So. And don't forget seek direction.app. Yes. A new resource. We're going to be doing a webinar on that in March. So again, stay tuned. So cool. You want to do one more Anne? one more question? Yeah, this is kind of a good one. Um, What does your reset look like when you feel far from God or in a dry season, dry days? Mm-hmm. What does your reset look like? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, I think it's the continued showing up every day, but sometimes we just need to take kind of a little bit of time out and maybe have a desert day and just go spend some time with the Lord and just put our phone away, grab some scriptures, grab a good book and just bring a journal and go, go to mass, go to confession, go make a good confession and just sit with the Lord and say, Lord, what's going on? You know, what's, what's going on? What are you, what are you inviting me to? And and to kind of just choose to begin again, you know, it, like we talked about, and, and the word is heavily overly used. The word intentional is heavily overused, but it's true. Like our life really, you know, our character and our life is made up of the thousands of little decisions that we make every single day. And we know that's true in every aspect of our life in every aspect. And so I think sometimes maybe, maybe Lent is that for you? Like maybe it's Ash Wednesday or a day in Lent where you're like, nope, I need to just spend some time and just and literally hit the reset button and say, okay, I want to, what are you asking of me? Or what's, what's going on? What are the things I want to avoid in my life or what's stirring? That's making my heart sing, you know, and just spend some time with the Lord and, and begin and begin anew and just try do the, just do the one thing, do one thing and do it well. I mean, even if it's for Lent, that's all you got to do. Just do the one thing and do it well, because we can't do the 10 till we can do the one. So, yeah. Right. And one last thing, because a couple of people actually wrote it right in a row, uh, right in a row. So I want to um, just mention it real quick. They're just clarifying between Jesus healing versus us fixing. Yeah. Yeah. The fixing is kind of more of an, I think like this, it's like a machine or like, there's something wrong with you. Okay. And Jesus never looks at us and said, there's something wrong with you. Like what St. Julian of Norwich says that when God sees our sin, he sees our pain. Like he sees where our hearts have been broken. So nobody wants to be fixed. We're not something to be fixed for people to be loved. And, and loved is what love is what brings us into communion. Time doesn't heal all wounds. It's, it's love that heals all wounds. And so Jesus isn't coming to like fix us and kind of make us and then kind of set us back into the world on our own. He's coming to bring us into relationship with himself. So he's not looking at us as a project or he's not looking at us of like, oh my gosh, get yourself together. He, he sees us in our wholeness and that's why he can restore us because he can bring us back to the truth of who we are, who he already sees us to be, who we already exist before him. And it's his love that does that. His, his, his sight is not one of problem solving. His sight is one of wholeness and communion because he deeply loves us. Wow. What a great way to, what a great note to end on. And I just want to invite everybody to pray for sister Miriam and uh, your ministry of healing. Pray for all of those who need to hear this message and um, whether it's through this book restore or through your speaking, um, 
in all the ways that you touch people, just that the Lord would continue to anoint you and, and keep his right hand on you and, and um, bless, bless people through you. So thank you. I received that. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Father Boniface, could we ask you to um, give us your blessing tonight? Mm, Happily. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great gift of this time, for the beautiful things that you have done in the hearts of Anne and Claire and Sister Miriam that allow us through their conversation to touch your love in a very personal and tangible way. Help us to retain all that you spoke to our hearts, that it might continue our healing journey with you and deepen our relationship with you. Bless these women richly and bless all of those who have participated in this Zoom cast. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Sister Miriam. And thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, You're all in our prayers. We're so grateful for you. And we look forward to spending Lent with all of you in prayer. God bless you.